the second half of the 2000s was an interesting time. It is when the 7th generation of consoles truly took off. It was also a time where the jumping graphical fidelity made people obsessed with the idea of making games more quote-unquote realistic, leading into the military shooter genre reaching its peak. And with realistic graphics also came a different kind of obsession. The idea of both the industry and players to show the world and people outside this hobby that it wasn't just a phase, mom. Games became more sharp and defined, but that chase of realism also led to games coming out with a more serious and edgy tone in an attempt to look more mature and quote-unquote grown-up. And that is how we got little gems like Prototype. Prototype is a unique type of game. It's an open-world superhero game where the conflict can be summed up as an anti-hero with no regard for innocent lives fights two factions of unrepentant bad guys who also have no regard for innocent lives. It is also a game where you get to be an unstoppable monster, one that feeds some people and can elbow drop tanks. This game was also an odd creature from Activision, a rare moment where they decided to pay a developer studio to make a new IP in between bloating the market with their hero games and being on their way to do the same with the Call of Duty IP. While it managed to do well enough to get a sequel, the studio ultimately closed down, and now, in 2022, there is not much to speak of except the memories, and the ability to play it only if you still have a copy and a 7 gen console, or in my case, a PC. So let's talk about how well this game holds up in this day and age. Prototype puts you in the tendrils of Alex Mercer, a former Gentex scientist who woke up at a morgue in New York with no memories of how he got there or why he suddenly gained superpowers. His entire journey is about recovering those memories, uncovering the web of intrigue for Gentech and facing a major pandemic of the Black Light virus, a disease that feeds on organic matter and grows uncontrollably with it, turning people and entire streets into fleshy monstrosities. He is also facing off against the US military, namely a black ops organization called Blackwatch, looking to contain the infection no matter the cost, pumping as much lead and gunpowder as possible into the infected. And that's the gist of it really. For an open world game, the plot is actually pretty light, but also very fascinating, and the way to make progress is through mostly chaos, gaudy, unrepentant, beautiful chaos. Being a biomass monster, Alex's superpowers involve the basics, super speed, super strength, super gliding, and he's also a shapeshifter. In order to defend himself and lay waste onto his enemies, Alex can develop his body into very sharp and very deadly weapons, and he is going to need it, because this game's story and sandbox is one big crescendo. While early in the game you mostly deal with soldiers pelting you with their rifles and mutants clumsily trying to tickle you, eventually you start facing off against tanks, helicopters, and the mutants become larger and deadlier. So the chaos that is this game then becomes a game of playing your combat smart, knowing when to slice and dice, and when to retreat to recover. While you can take a lot of punishment in this game, Alex is not invincible. As I said in the beginning, he eats people and other organic material to survive, and you can absorb humans and mutants equally to regain your health, and last a bit longer in the fight. But in order to do that, you need to be able to play out the consuming animation, but it can be easily interrupted if another enemy hits you hard enough. The other alternative to this is to switch to stealing enemy equipment so you can turn the tide of the battle in your favor, but alternatively, you can be stealthy. Consuming your enemy doesn't just replenish your health, consuming humans allows you to take the appearance of the person you ate, and in the case of enemy soldiers, it allows you to walk among them without being bothered too much, as long as you are not directly attacking them. These very basic systems create a game with a crazy sense of depth. The true charm of the open world genre, and especially open gameplay, is to have this playground where virtually everything can be a valid strategy. So you can end up doing a lot more fun things than simply mashing the attack buttons and hope that is enough to turn all your enemies into mincemeat. For the sake of fun, let me give you a very good and practical example. Sometimes in the game, you will get missions where you need to destroy an armored unit. You can just go up front and start elbow dropping the tanks like it's nobody's business. 
Alternatively, you can hijack one of the tanks and turn their own arsenal against them. Then move on onto the next tank unit and even take them out from a distance before they even have a chance to realize what hit them. But if you are feeling extremely cheeky and want to save yourself the hassle of fighting and chasing so many tanks, you can disguise yourself as a soldier, get close to the tank, slip inside the tank unnoticed because they think you are one of them, and just vacate the newly acquired tank and move on to the next, since in this imply the crew piloting the tank gets consumed as soon as Alex gets in. It's lateral thinking in its most beautiful form. Getting to think outside the box in order to achieve your victory without anything holding your hand. It's very liberating. It's awesome. It makes you feel smart about it, especially when you pull those moves off and get away unscathed. And this comes very handy for even the most chaotic parts of both the main story and the open world. Because as I said earlier, the more the game progresses, the more chaotic things get. Both the military and the infected start waging a very intense war in the streets, and deciding what to do with each territory is up to you. You can go into military territory, consume the commander to infiltrate inside their base, and then just slowly consume everyone inside it, one by one, without ever getting noticed and with none of the soldiers wondering why the base is suddenly more empty. Then, once you are done with the base, you can attack it and blast it into dust, liberating the territory and leaving you with some juicy rewards. On the infected territory, you get to fight hives, entire buildings consumed by the virus that are constantly spawning mutants that can easily hinder your progress. You can just attack it directly in the good old fashioned way, but this means you are facing both mutants and the military at the same time, so a very valid strategy is to infiltrate a military tank while in disguise and then actually join forces with the soldiers to take down the hives and liberate the territory as well. There are even arcadey open world events where if something you are trying is not working, you can think outside the box and use different methods to achieve your goal. Speaking of which, I guess this is a good moment to talk about the open world itself. And the open world is… actually not very busy. Keep in mind, this game came out in the middle of the 7th generation, and the main focus was always the powers and the destruction. So there's not too many things to do other than fighting for territory or little arcade challenges. And I feel that's for the better, really. The bulk of an open world game is not really how many times you can copy paste the same content on increasingly larger maps, but rather how much fun you can make the moment to moment gameplay. I never really bother going for all the open world side content, because I don't really care for time attack challenges. The fact I am able to play, replay, and enjoy this game no matter how many playthroughs I've done is what makes it fun. Not completing the checklist or how much content there is to consume, no pun intended. That being said, this game is not without flaws or jank. Remember when I talk about the chaos and the button mashing? That is one of the easiest ways to get yourself killed. As you advance through the game, explosives and hunters become more common. The format is pretty obnoxious as it can stun you pretty bad, and the latter is especially horrible as they are glued to you no matter how much distance you put between you and them. And the worst part is, they can sucker punch you every time you are in the middle of something important in infected territory. And that is a major flaw with this game. Look. I say this very often, I can help the losing constantly in a game because I am clearly doing something wrong. Strategies and playstyles have to change in order to avoid frustration. And more often than not, like I said, I can accept when a game over happened because it was my fault. It's a very different one when a good number of game overs come because enemies continue blindsiding you out of nowhere, and in worst case scenarios costing you a victory at the last minute because an enemy has an obnoxious unblockable attack that can stun lock you if you get caught in it. But that kind of jank I can sort of live with, because a lot of the frustration dies down when you start thinking outside the box, that's why it's so satisfying when you are tearing through heavily armed or well prepared enemies, because you defeated them not just with brute force, but with your brain, by outsmarting them. Buying upgrades for yourself also helps a lot. Consuming enemies, completing missions and other open world events, reward you with evolution points that you can use to make yourself a lot deadlier and a lot resistant to damage. Considering the jank I already mentioned, you do need it. 
Thankfully, the game drops this like they are candy, so you don't even have to do a lot of busy work before you reach the more frustrating parts of the game. And I appreciate that this game has side content I personally enjoy a lot. Namely, the consuming events where stealth plays a major part. And the bigger reason I like this is because buried among the crowds of humans, mutants, and military personnel, you have the targets of the web of intrigue. This game's version of the audio log. Every person involved with the virus or the events that led to the infection that is destroying New York just happens to live here too. And you can pick them off one by one as you glide around the streets, looking for your next story mission. It's a very fun way to put together the more intricate details about the plot, because for all of the edgy silliness, this game has a very fun story to uncover. The mystery and the intrigue go beyond Alex's backstory, and making sense of it all and all the atrocities committed by Blackwatch in an attempt to create a bioweapon help even more in motivating you to take them down along the infected, because in a way, this is their fault. This is also where some of the edginess can become a little silly. As I said, this game is a testament of its time. Because in an attempt to make a totally serious and quote-unquote grown-up story, Prototype doesn't really have too many characters that you would like to root for. Every cast member is either an anti-hero or a downright genocidal psychopath. The only named characters that are legit decent people can be counted on one hand, and the civilian population that you are supposedly saving are just cannon fodder for Alex and the other two factions to be helplessly mowed down. But then again, that is very much the point. This game is not so much about being a superhero and more about having powers beyond human comprehension and using an entire helpless city as your playground for that. By the end of the day, Prototype is a really good game and one of the more underrated gems of the 7th generation. More than just a proof of concept, this game provides the kind of fun you would often only find in the 6th generation, where you can replay a game as many times over and never really get tired of it regardless if you already did 100% completion. It was an earnest attempt to make a fun sandbox superhero game, and that's why I am happy to give it a decent and well-deserved 8 out of 10. Sure, some of the visuals have an aged well, and the writing can be a mixed bag of genuine good mystery and conspiracies with some silly edgelord stuff, but it was still a very fun experience that I am happy to keep revisiting to this day. It was also a nice peek at one rare moment where the AAA publishing War Machine actually cared to try something new, and it wasn't busy treating its employees like dirt or becoming so twisted and horrible that they are facing multiple lawsuits and getting acquired by Microsoft in the last ditch attempt to save the company before the negative press for their crimes causes the company to collapse on itself.